I hope you had a, had a good lunch and got a chance to get a breath of fresh air. Um, but uh, if you didn't get the fresh air, um, prepare to be energized by the two speakers that we have in the next panel, um, which is called Intersections. And I think actually it's very exciting um, uh, look at both the, the sort of the institutional perspective matching sort of the almost the, the kind of more researcher perspective we would have had earlier today. So I'm going to, I think, uh, Seb Chan, you're, you're going first, right? So we're starting off with Seb Chan, the Chief Experience Officer. Uh, wait. Yep, All right. Um, and I can't even say the proper name of your institution. You'll have to say that yourself. So why don't you come up and speak, and then um, I'll introduce you afterwards. We'll have a bit of discussion in between and maybe save some time for some meta discussion at the end. Thanks, Leif. So we're actually going through a uh, rebrand at the moment and a rebuild, so I don't really know what, the, what our institution is, really. <laughs> AUCMI is what I call it, but anyway. But actually, that's the thing that the visitors always, the first thing they ask is, what do the letters actually stand for? Because we've taken the Australian Centre for the Moving Image off our uh, logo. Logo? Yeah, logo. Um, so I'm not an academic. Um, I'm in museums. Um, and I guess I've been involved in a lot of research projects um, and also run a lot of things that other people have called labs. Um, and I guess it, it, my talk's kind of a bit about what we're building, the new thing that's appearing in Mel Melbourne um, and how we might work uh, together in the future, but also about some of the things that I've experienced um, working inside muse museums and the challenges we've had working with academic research projects and uh, how we might collectively uh, work to make things dif dif different. I don't necessarily want to say better, but different. I, I mean, I guess for me, museums can and should be a site of research, a site of practice, and the museum itself should be a laboratory. Um, the challenges of that are very real. I started my career in the museum world at the Powerhouse Museum um, at the turn of the millennium. Uh, it sounds like I'm very old, because I am now. Um, when di digitization was sort of becoming um, a thing that the museum was really talk talking about. And um, you know, way, way back, this photo's from about two, 2004, that three, 3D di digitization well predated all the scan scanning of other things at other bigger museums. Anyway, around two, 2005, my team's um, got a bit of not notoriety for doing this collection uh, database for, for the powerhouse and then an API. Actually, we were probably the first API that was public um, in uh, the museum world, cl closely followed by uh, the, the Brooklyn Museum uh, in 2008. And, and it's, this was a really fertile period where there were people who had grown up on the web who were looking at museum collections and museum data, not as researchers, but as web kind of people. Um, and uh, this was an interesting period. Um, and the questions that my teams are asking ourselves then, and we were working with a lot of, ac well, a lot of academics then too, was how might, 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 might we connect the museum? And all the things that we saw would, would become digitized to the world beyond the museum itself. And that seemed like a pretty good thing to be fo focused on and doing. It was the mood of the, um, the times. And um, people got excited by that notion that the, the content, the riches, the knowledge that museums held, held might actually be better expressed outside of exhibits. And that they might better be used and manipulated and vis visualized and played, played with beyond the confines of the build, building itself. And then um, in 2011, I, ended, um, I went and worked for the Smithsonian, uh, and that kind of turned around for me. And um, there are, num there are, num there are num a number of key experiences just before I moved to New York that, were really, uh, that really challenged my notions of pro providing access to museum data and museum collections as open access things. And I was a big proponent of that, and still am, uh, but actually my, ex my experiences at Mona um, in 2010 really started to sh re reshape my think thinking about the purpose of the build, bu uh, building. So between 2010 and about, I think about last, la last year, you couldn't get access to Mona's collection database at all without visiting first. Like it was not possible to get in without using the O, 
and you only got the O if you had visited and you could only log in to see all the things you hadn't seen when you had actually physically visited. Now they've changed that around now and I believe you can actually browse some at least of their, of their collection on their website. But that in 2010 for, uh, for me was a really interesting provocation around actually the value of the stuff is actually in physically seeing it. Possibly, probably. Um, so I started to think about this notion of the museum itself, both in its digital sense and its physical sense, as an interface, physical in, in, interface and a social one to an archive that was increasingly digitised, but also that the building itself needed to be better designed to work as um, that interface. So at Cooper Hewitt, when I arrived there, uh, 210,000 design and decorative arts pieces in its collection, uh, mixed, mixed kind of levels of documentation. But when I, when, when I arrived there, there were 10,000 uh, 10, pretty scant records on their web, website. And, and the very first thing when I was setting up a team there was, well, let's assume when the museum reopens, the museum had just closed for a major redevelopment, um, that the assumption should be that by the time we reopened the building, everything should be digitised and be on the web and addressable. And how might we then design the building to allow uh, people to use, use it better? And of course, when you've got a collection like this, it's kind of awesome. This was the ma mascot for my team, um, the spanking cat. Um, so we built a series of tools that opened up not only the galleries, which I won't talk, talk about at all, but we made an API, a proper one. Actually, I was, uh, managed to have the fortune of working with one of the uh, great developers in our space who was previously at Flickr. So Aaron Cope um, worked with me and a team on, on really building a Flickr-style model of a museum collection on uh, the web. Now Aaron's at the SFO Museum at the airport, and if you want to see where the future of museums might actually go, an airport museum is a pretty interesting model for that. Lots and lots of tourists, very secure, and uh, in a no state, it's, it's, it's in a demilitarized, non-territorial -ter zone. Anyway, I digress. Um, so the API uh, was the center of the museum's web operations, its collection database fed into it, its um, cus cus customer relationship database, so its, its um, uh, borrower database in, in uh, library uh, talk. Uh, fed into that, uh, generated the website, and generated a series of gallery experiences. And the, AP and the API was relatively easy for people to use. Again, have, having Aaron as part of the team was absolutely critical in taking that very uh, user-centered design approach to the API, um, uses, the users being uh, um, other developers, soft, uh, software developers. And his experiences from designing the APIs at Flickr, he uh, did a lot of work around geocoding and the mapping of photos in Flickr, um, was central to making, um, uh, making a series of connectors to the museum's data and collections that didn't take people very long at all to learn and make working things with. And as most of us know, one of the big challenges in this space is if, you're, if you hold a collection and you make an API for it, there are so many other more interesting things that students could plug into. So if your thing's really hard, they will just go to the more interesting, e easier to use things. So fortunately, the Cooper Hewitt, um, we built something really great there. Um, but, you know, as um, I was thinking over the last little while, um, Tourist attractions, and this is what museums have become, and this is how museums are f supported uh, by governments, um, is we're measured on footfall um, and we're measured on the number of um, uh, hotel room beds we sell in a city. We're a tourist attractor, right? So we aren't funded, designed, or actually organisationally structured to deliver these sort of software service, uh, services, let alone other services. Um, li libraries, on the other hand, I would say are way better at that. Um, and sad, sad, sadly, I'd have to say that all that work that was done at the powerhouse has largely evaporated. The downed kind of loadable uh, CS, 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 CSV files of the collection database that was used by a lot of um, digital humanities uh, lecturers uh, as sample data for students to experiment with, no longer available on the website. 
Uh, the API is very hard to find now too if it exists. Um, and it wasn't that the team moved away from it, it's just that it wasn't supportable. I would also say the Cooper Hewitt stuff, um, I still get the GitHub alerts about sec security things. It hasn't been touched in three years. Um, and these are because of that. Um, they are structural challenges and they are how you operate a public facing museum. Um, and it's, it's, it's grim. Anyway, I'm in Melbourne now. And Mel Melbourne isn't grim. We have a progressive government. Uh, we have a large invest invest investment in arts and culture. Um, the coffee is excellent, all those things. I <laughs> uh, also work at a museum of all the things that are in copyright now, which is, which is, which is an interesting place to be. Um, as the National Museum of Film, TV, Video Games, Digital Culture and Art, as we say, um, we are switching quite explicitly to talking about ourselves as a museum. Um, and that is about having people like you expecting us to, to do and deliver museum-like services to the research community. Uh, one, of, uh, one of my remits is running the university's steering group and the relationships with universities. It's been a big focus for us. Um, for the public side, though, we talk about being a place for watchers, players and makers. And we get a lot of them. We get a lot of people through the building, so that's good for ticking the boxes, a bunch of stuff. Visitors, visitors are satisfied. We make exhibitions that tour. Um, this Game Masters exhibit uh, has been, is currently in Minnesota. Uh, Dream, DreamWorks is currently in Rio doing some ridiculous amount of people per day, like 10,000 people a day. Uh, we've started more art commissions and new works and commissioning works in new media forms as well, which is, which is very exciting. And of course, um, you may have also heard we're running a co-working space and accelerator program. What's been interesting about that is that that is bringing makers in, in the kind of side of the building to sit beside our staff. So our curatorial staff, our, um, um, our education staff, my teams, sit alongside actual pra practitioners making artistic works and commercial works. Um, and, 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 and importantly, and this is quite a shift for the, for the, for the institution, is um, whilst it was establishing its brand between 2004 and 2015, it looked inside and was developing itself as a very particular type of center. Now, with, with, with Katrina Sedg Sedgwick as our direct, director and CEO, we see ourselves as part of an ecosystem and that we are only as strong as the people we, we collaborate with. Um, and that's been quite a shift for kind of the organization and that, in, that includes commercial makers, di distributors, other institutions, ac academia, and the community of makers. Um, because at the end of the day, we've realised, and, and you know, we should have realised this many, many years ago, but I think this has accelerated in the last uh, decade, is that really being the National Museum of Film, TV and Video Games means that everything that you've got access to outside the build building. Now, of course, there's some film, TV, video games and special things that we have the only copy of, but for the most part, we do exhibits that interpret the stuff in uh, the world itself. And in fact, what we're about when we design exhibits and other um, spaces and experiences is that we deal with time. We deal with the currency of time and we want to val value the time that visitors give us because the stuff that we are about takes time to watch, play and experience. So we can't, we have to do the hard task of taking a 60-hour video game like Assassin's, like Assassin's Creed or Red Dead Redemption 2 and compress that down to a thing that someone can say, oh, I played a little bit of that and it makes sense because this ref, 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 references all these, these other things and I'm curious about playing another 59 hours and 58 minutes of that in my own time. Anyway, that sort of stuff. Um, but that's really challenge, challenging within the museum space because not only are we, we sucking time out of our visitors, we have to value, value that time and return it to them. So fortunately, I said we live in a pretty good environment in Vic, Victoria. Labor, Labor government's been give, giving us a large investment. This is the largest investment in the institution since it 
op opened in 2001. Of course, its past was in the State, state Film Centre and Cinemedia. Um, this is allowing us to make a big shift. Um, so opening, re re reopening in 2020, we close in uh, a number of weeks now. Um, if you haven't been recently, come up for the school holidays. It's probably the last chance to see the current permanent galleries. Uh, new permanent galleries, entirely new permanent galleries. An, order, um, um, an audience testing lab, which I'll talk about in a bit. A media, a media, a media preservation lab. Lear learning centre for these literacies, all of these sort of things. And all of these are about building that ecosystem of collaborators, uh, researchers and, audi and audiences. And, and for us, that's been an equal part of design challenge, a lot of uh, design of the things, which I'll show you, show you in a second. Tech, tech, technological change, the permanent galleries as they stand now, uh, launched just after the iPhone came out in Australia. So they were designed before that. So they didn't predict what would happen to have a small networked pocket pocket computer that you could not only watch and play game, games on, but you could make them on too, uh, let alone films and television as well. And uh, cultural change in the, org in, 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 uh, the, org in the organisation too, so a large shift going on. Um, so new foyer space and a new welcoming staircase to sit on and hang, hang out and watch and do stuff in. If anyone's been to our space recent, recently, you'll notice that this is perhaps a little less shopping, shopping, shopping centre-ish than it is now, but it still reflects perhaps the, some of the tropes of a, shop, a shopping centre. That's, if we'd got 360 million, it might be different, but 36 is pretty good. Uh, Federation Square, again, much more welcoming. The first thing you see won't be tickets. Most of our stuff's free, right, as we should be. New permanent uh, galleries, uh, much, much more exciting, dynamic, but more spacious too. Um, new visitor, exp visitor experiences and interactive things, which are all fun and good. Um, we have a lot of Australian and Indigenous uh, storytelling in, in kind of side the new galleries too, and really giving that its proper place at the heart of the, perm uh, the permanent galleries. And beneath all of this, and, and this is a bit like the drawing uh, from the Cooper Hewitt of the API. We're building a thing that used, used to be called the, 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 the Museum OS. It is now called the XOS. Um, and at the heart of that, that will drive a whole bunch of other things in the gallery um, and will allow researchers and others to plug into it and build other things with it. Um, to, to TBD, uh, but we're building it, exp building it explicitly so researchers and uh, creative tech, tech, tech technologists can make playful things as well as serious things with it. Uh, launching a me media, media preservation lab that will not only show publicly the processes of digitisation, but also the processes of di digital preservation. Uh, Time-based media art, video game, uh, uh, video game pres preservation, and some other things. Oh, we have a pretty large collection of film, amateur video, and uh, 7,000 7, 7, 7, video games. Um, obviously, like, ev like, ev like, ev like everybody, we've been playing around with machine learning and computer vision around some of that. Um, kind of not that exciting, to be honest, but um, again, building in some of those uh, things as default starting, uh, starting points for us. This is just nav uh, navigating through our, uh, about 20 hours of our footage by um, uh, uh, tags, uh, machine kind of generated tags in the collection. Some of the best, the horse kind of like mammal is like, it's just a horse, like it's not horse like, anyway. Um, computers are weird like that. Um, anyway, the one about love is particularly good and maybe it'll get to it. I'll, I'll just keep talking until it does get to it because it's kind of awesome. Uh, maybe soon, maybe. Oh. Anyway, it's not going to happen now for me. Anyway, um, so again, we're trying to do a lot of things that, that are really the scaff scaffolding for um, people to build things on in the future. And again, the time-based media nat nature of our stuff is without these tools, most of these sequ sequ sequences would never be seen by anyone. No, no, no one is going to go and watch no, no, no one in quotes, I should say. There will be a few people who will go and watch the entire film that this is from, 
um, but actually nav navigating to particular scene, 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 scenes in it and also doing looking at how fre frequently scenes like that appear is a much more exciting way of looking at the collection and navigating it. Here's love, for example. There you go. Finally, it came up. Um, but yeah, and, and most of this, uh, this footage has very scant metadata, if any. Um, so there you go. It's kind of cute, right? It's super cute. Anyway, there we go. Oh, look at this. This is beautiful too. Look at that. 60s, right? Anyway, uh, a little while ago, uh, we obviously, we did this at the Powerhouse, we did this at Cooper Hewitt. Um, collection data, give it away, get rid of it, uh, keep working on it, all that stuff. That's all there. Uh, we did some work with our MIT's um, uh, students in their visual communications group uh, to do very sim simple, uh, simple uh, graphical rep representations of some of the trends and patterns in this. And when this was presented to the staff, people were really surprised that this was even possible. So it's actually in the museum side, um, the, un the un kind of understanding of what is possible is very, very low. Um, so all the work that you folk are doing is way more exciting than this. And most people don't know inside museums that this is possible. Um, also, on the video game side, super important, um, we know that obviously video games are shifting from those things, the chips, to emulation, um, and uh, very excited, very excited, um, excitingly one of um, the projects that uh, was an ARC, uh, was a successful one with Professor Melanie Swarwell, who's here at the back. Uh, we will be setting up as part of that AR, the, 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 that ARC, an, em, um, an emulation as a service node, which might allow others to build on top of that. And that would be great. Um, that's kind of cool. So the, or, the Audience Lab um, is also a project that's come out of uh, some work with RMIT. Um, this was seen as an opportunity for makers, uh, both artistic and commercial, to come and test some of what they're, what they're making, and also for researchers to research how, how things are tested and to introduce the public to both the testing methods and that research. Um, so this might, 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 might be bio, sort of biometrics and cinema watch, watching, or contextual play, play, play testing of video games or new, uh, new devices. Um, this is just a slide from one of the uh, research sessions we, we did with RMIT on this. Um, this is now becoming part of our programmatic mix, not, not so much uh, a place in the uh, building, but this will happen every month, once a month. Um, we did one with our RMIT games uh, students last year, uh, where all the students who were making games came and uh, presented their work to the public and had to talk to players and explain to people's uh, grandparents about what this game where you play a pigeon actually is about and why that's really ama amazing and really good. And it was really in 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 interesting and exciting for the makers to need to explain to people who were not there in quotes, market, what they were doing. And it was really great for particularly the kids to go, hey, you're kind of like my, sis my sister or my mum, and you made that awesome game. What I might want to do that too. Um, and that making games doesn't always require writing code, and it's not to be confined to STEM. Anyway, I digress again. Um, so this problem really hits museums super hard. And we need your help to turn that around uh, because I think museums are being pushed closer and closer towards this. Uh, we are tourist, tourist attractions for cities. We're part of civic reimaginings and the smart city and all that. We can't just be that. Um, so collaboration challenges that I've noticed, I've noticed in the last how, um, um, however long I've been in museums is like academics and universities, impact from research is really hard to explain. Um, and that's even hard for me to take to my CEO. My CEO, um, you know, Katrina was like, Seb, why do we do ARC ARCs? What value do they actually return to us? And I need your help to keep explaining why they matter. Um, nas national versus state priorities. Um, again, I'm a state-based museum. 
trying to act at a national and perhaps global level, um, the funding priorities and all of those things are a big deal for us um, and being aware of those matters. Um, staff continuity and retention both in the academic world is challenging. In the museum world, in the museum tech world, it is a reaching a critical state. Most of the good people with, ex with experience have left the sec sector and the ones who are coming in now are not getting enough exposure to uh, projects that aren't about delivering user-centred marketing out, 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 outcomes than they should be. They should be being, exp being, ex being exposed to deeper, richer work. Um, museums are terrible at working with university processes and universities are very, very challenging. Uh, don't explain those processes well to us. Um, the ARC linkage pro 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 projects are super critical for us, but most museum directors and boards and executive teams don't know how the linkage model works, um, and it continues to change. Um, we're fortunate at the moment we have two with Melanie, um, and that's been really amazing, um, and uh, hopefully a turning point for my, inst my institution, but it's really helped that Melanie and Melanie's collaborators have been able to help us explain why these matter. Um, and that is also about aligning the, these opportunities and the timelines. Museum timelines are weird and um, a, bit a little bit opaque. Uh, similarly, from our, our um, side of the fence, research timelines don't make sense to most of the people in museums because we've lost all the research staff. When well, the research staff were in museums, it was much easier. Infrastructural challenges, um, this was something I was thinking about. There's been some work in uh, Victoria around Victorian collections. Creative Vic Victoria did a really good study of actual users of Victorian collections and Culture Vic Victoria. That hasn't been made public yet. But it was interesting that they were looking at the difference between researcher discovery needs and access needs. And this notion that giving people access to the data and giving them access to what is in your collection probably still means the researcher needs to make an appointment to see the actual thing. They just know where to go to get it. Um, and often the people who design museum collection databases and search searches smush those things together and it's not helping anybody, I would say. Um, the thing that's obvious is that to people who work in tech, tech, technology, but not so much to people who work in museums, is that museums haven't really figured out what infrastructure, what is possible and owned, I mean, owned kind of really possible at scale. Their sense of computing is still quite limited, um, and so we need to get better at de describe, de describing now what the, what the possibility space now is. And with that scale, of course, there are huge ethical issues. And they, those, those ethical issues, um, again, are poorly dealt, 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 dealt with within museums, I would say. Uh, we are developing our notions around what an ethics of being a tourist, tourist, a tourist attraction might be. Um, when we do that at scale, uh, we need your help too. Um, obviously, open, open, um, open uh, source tools are absolutely critical to, uh, to this. We also all know that most open, most open source tools are supported by one or two people in their spare time. That doesn't work. Um, and we need to find ways of making that work. Um, and we need to find ways of developing platforms, not, on, not only projects, which again come, come, comes back to how do we fund the right things. So thanks a lot. Questions? Or, or should we do them in the conversation? I don't know. I just wanted to see if there's a there's any kind of pressing question. We can go to the second. Cool. I'll hesitate Good. to ask you, but we'll move to the second presentation. Yeah, yeah. We'll do all the questions yeah. at the end. Right. So I'll ask Marie Louise Ayres to come up and give us a second perspective on this. Yeah. Over to you. Okay. Thank you. We've got it. 
Um, thanks very much for this invitation to speak to you today and may I acknowledge that this building in which we meet, which houses the majority of the library's physical and digital collections, houses the people responsible for those collections and which, in which many of you have conducted your research, stands on the traditional lands of the Ngambri and Ngunnawal peoples and that their elders do us great honour by working with us, especially in this, the International Year of Indigenous Languages. Um, now, I also want to apologise for the loss of what I'm sure were wonderful slides this morning. And ironically, this was not a digital problem. Um, this was that the power source over the projector failed and a new one had to be installed. And this is a good reminder that behind all of our discussions about infrastructure, there lies power of more than one sort. <laughs> so uh, earlier this year, I let the Academy know that I thought the Libraries as Labs concept would do well enough as a framing device for this big ideas panel on intersections. Many moons ago, I did a PhD in Australian literature, which means I love to think about metaphors and the way that they have the power to explain complex concepts and the power to structure our thinking. Just yesterday, for example, I listened to a radio piece on introducing game theory into cancer treatment and was struck by the ways in which the metaphor of being ahead of or playing the game uh, may be more resonant for a game-familiar society like ours uh, and may overtake the older metaphor of battling cancer. Few Australians now see or are specifically touched by actual battles, so it'll be interesting to see how that metaphor shifts. Both metaphors have the power to explain, but I think they also have the power to harden our conversation into tracks that take on lives of their own. So bear with me as I play a bit with this metaphor, libraries as labs, and think about the ways in which we speak about social constructs and the way they influence the ways we think. So when you think of a lab, what pops into your mind? Is it this? Granted, probably how my grandparents thought about labs if they thought about them at all. Is it this or this? Probably the image of a lab that I, 50-something, grew up with. It might be this, a traditional lab, but with more colour and more women. But still with that sense of a lab as a defined space, in which materials were brought into the laboratory from somewhere else and in which precision instruments were used to measure, <laughs> to dissect, detect, hypothesise, to replicate previous results, etc. So this is one sort of lab, but it's not the only sort of lab. This, for example, is the lab of my daughter-in-law, a climate scientist who designs, tests and runs complex, extremely data-hungry mathematical models in efforts to understand climate extremes and the degree to which individual or groups of extreme events can be attributed to global, to global climate change. For the decade in which I've known her, Sophie has referred to her laptop always as her lab. As she said when she sent this photo to me, my lab comes everywhere with me and doesn't mind being close to my daughter's conjunctivitis. <laughs> now this lab is less clearly a defined place, although it does also rely on taking in materials, in this case data, from elsewhere. But in addition to supporting production of research outputs, this lab also returns materials, enriched data, back to various somewhere else's. This kind of research is supported by large research infrastructure, NCRIS infrastructure, among others, that allows giant scientific data sets to be compiled, shared, modelled and analysed, with analysed results returning to a common knowledge store, or at least a common, a common knowledge store for scientists. Now I'd like to take you to a very different kind of lab. Canberrans know about this lab, but for those visiting the city and, um, or indeed the country, this lab, Mulligan's Flat at the top there, is a nature sanctuary that nestles hard up against Canberra's suburbs. It is different to Canberra's other nature reserves in that it is fenced to keep out introduced predators, especially foxes and cats. 
Its laboratory purpose is to test and examine the conditions under which small mammals such as the betong and eastern quoll and birds, notably the bushstone curlew, might be able to flourish in areas in which they were once incredibly abundant but are now locally extinct. I'd like to introduce you now to Dr Kate Grarock, an ecologist who until late last year worked at Mulligan's Flat, and to thank Anne Jones, the host of ABC's Off Track, for kindly sending these clips um, from her latest episode um, aired on Saturday and available via podcast. So we sort of look at Mulligans as a massive outdoor laboratory where we're doing sort of different, I guess, manipulations and looking at, oh, what happens if we add fallen timber? Oh, wow, the beetle diversity goes through the roof and sort of learning like that. So it is very new. It has to be one of the biggest open-air laboratories in the world. <laughs> okay, but this lab is also a public space, a place of learning for the community. Just... Like the, the forest is alive at night and it's so exciting to see. I think not enough Australians get out in the forest at night or the woodlands at night and, and see that and hear that, those critters that are everywhere, you know, the crunches, the squeaks, the, you know, the running across the forest floor and finding insects that little quolls are doing or the betongs digging at the, the bottom of your wattle tree and trying to get some sap. So it really is just a hive of activity 24-7 out here in the sanctuary, whether it be people or animals. <laughs> So um, I highly recommend one of those night tours. I did one last year in very much sub-zero temperatures and it was magic. Um, you don't have to go out at night, of course. We've got some very early joggers and runners groups that come through with headlamps some mornings. The birds always, you know, get pretty rowdy once the first light comes through. Okay, so runners and walkers might just pass through this place. They might be tourists or casual visitors. But um, this is also a place, um, as you saw here, where the community gives back in the form of an army of volunteers, citizen scientists who are very much part of the enterprise. And some of you, I suspect, may know where I'm going with this. And uh, just because I knew that our international visitors want to know what an eastern quoll is, um, here is Kate with one of these amazing little beasties. Now let me slide this metaphor a little to thinking about the bush and about forests and about the kinds of collections we here at the library are responsible for building and stewarding for the very long term. These next few images are just a tiny part of the mighty, mighty Peter Dombrovskis archive, all large format negatives which require special caretaking and which pose really significant digitisation challenges. They're available online, form the basis of a wonderful exhibition and the fantastic book is for sale in the bookshop, which I hope you visit while you're here. So how are we to think about libraries as labs? If you're a researcher with a particular question to ask, you may very well be thinking more in the traditional lab way. That is, you come, you use materials, perhaps dissect them, you take them away and you create new scholarly knowledge from them. Eventually, your new scholarly knowledge is likely to come back to us in the form of an addition to our collection. But in a non-digital paradigm, the connections between the materials you used and the new knowledge you produce may not be very explicit. And with few exceptions, you're unlikely to ask yourself how the materials you used came to be available here for you to use or to ask yourself how the decisions we as a library make as we develop our collections inevitably frame the research that it is possible to do here. You may perceive the library as a place of order, as a place of precision, as something of a manicured garden, and indeed some parts of our collections are like manicured gardens. But I think it's essential to acknowledge this. There is much wildness in collections like ours. Not just the wildness that might come about because the collection is vast and because we're not exactly sure what's in every part of the collection, but also because of the wildness of the connections that are latent in those collections. 
I have long believed that our collections are nocturnal animals whispering among themselves at night. And one of my absolute favourite things about this job is having researchers like you and those who apply for our fellowships, scholarships and study grants. And I want to give a shout out here to the academies um, who all participate in our fellowships advisory committee. So we see those proposing research projects that are endlessly surprising. I cannot tell you how many times I've read a proposal or talked to somebody in a reading room about what they're doing, doing and have thought, you plan to do this with that collection? Because I would never have thought of it. And then to see each intensive researcher's amazement as they realise how deep and broad our collections are and how endlessly curious and ready to help my colleagues around the library are as this research proceeds. As researchers, you have wonderful opportunities to lose yourselves in our collections, to sniff the deep loam of collections carefully developed over decades, to marvel at the twists and turns, and to come out of the forest with something new and fresh, something you didn't expect. It is a combination of your curiosity in our collections, our careful curation, our expertise, the curiosity of a legion of non-academic researchers because they outnumber you greatly, that thicken up and enrich that loam, that renew it for the next generation. Which leads me to the possibilities of digital loam, of an open laboratory rich with data and with opportunities for all to dig to explore that data, to share that knowledge, and to work together on a shared purpose. We imagine with you, but we're also deeply practical, focusing on long-term strategic priorities and allocating our investment to meet those needs as best we can. And of course, Trove is where we've been allocating a lot of investment over the last 10 or so years. As a national library, our purposes are specified in legislation and they don't change. Or the ways in we, although the ways in which we express and animate those purposes certainly do change. Our first purpose is to collect, to develop that loam, that mossy forest, that arid bushland. Nowhere is our commitment to collecting today what will be important tomorrow more obvious than our collecting of websites. Joy mentioned this morning that we released the Australian Web Archive, nine billion files, fully text searchable, world leading, two weeks ago. But this would not have been possible if we had not committed early to collecting websites. We started in 1996 and we were the first national library in the world to do this. Most national libraries still don't do this. We started when there were no tools, we had to build them. When there was no skilled workforce, we had to build on it. And we're so lucky that one of those original builders is sitting right here in this audience right at the moment. I won't stare at him, he's a shy person. <laughs> when there was no legislative cover, we did not gain the right to collect born digital material, including websites, until 2016. Hence, the majority of our web archive stayed dark for many years. And then when there certainly was no new money and there were many fewer people. When I started work at the library exactly 17 years ago, there were 500 of us. There are now 371. And also, when there is no swapping out of digital for print, we still add 1.5 kilometres of physical material a year to our collection. And like our sister cultural institutions in the portfolio, we're about to hit a physical storage crisis. But digital brought us new opportunities as well as new responsibilities and challenges. And everything about the way that we work has had to change in this hybrid physical digital world. So making our collections available to Australians, engaging Australians with our collections is a really high priority. And as I've said to my colleagues at the library, 98% of Australians live more than three hours from Canberra, and that is a powerful driver for making collections available in digital form. We've built a huge digitised collection, and until very recently, with not a single extra dollar from government, 
and an infinitesimally small number of dollars from the university sector. We are using our current funding wisely and will deliver about 9.5 million new digital items over the four-year funding period, including parts of the RH Matthews collection James Rose mentioned earlier today in consultation with a number of Indigenous communities. This speaks directly to a major strategic priority. It is more important to us as a national library to collect from, connect with, and provide access to communities which have few other tools than it is to connect with the academic sector, which has its own investment streams to build tools. It's more important to build our understanding of and, um, and, and provide appropriate and respectful access to Indigenous materials we know are in our collections and that we can't understand without working with communities than it is to meet the specific research interests of an individual academic or even a discipline. It is not, of course, always either or, but it is more important to us as a national library that we ensure that ordinary Australians, in inverted commas, because none of them are ordinary, living in Western Sydney or Fitzroy Crossing or Bruny Island or Alice Springs or Barmaga on Cape York can use and access our collections and it is to serve your specific needs. Our remit as a national library is broad. We must serve everybody, and if in doing so we can also serve you, that's a fantastic bonus, but it's not our primary driver. If we think again about Mulligans, it's actually the night visitors and the morning runners and the army of curious and committed volunteers that are uppermost in my mind when I think about who it is that we serve. It's in the collaborate space that you know, intersects, I think, with our laboratory idea today. Our primary and most powerful collaboration is actually with um, the State and Territory Libraries, so NASLA, National State and Territory Libraries of Australia, where we work deeply together and have for decades to join up our digital collecting and access work. In years gone by, much of our collaboration with uh, this sector and with university libraries was around metadata. But our focus now is really around shared digital content. It's efficient and effective collection and dissemination in a large continent with a small population. It is hard, hard work. But if we don't do it, there simply won't be a future collection for you or anyone else to work on. So the research sector is just one of our potential collaboration partners and we have to constantly review where we can invest. In our corporate plan, we have clearly articulated to government our commitment to partner with GLAM and the research se sector to achieve what I think is still a pressing national concern, how to connect researchers with the very large scale digital Australian collections that live outside the university sector. And in Australia, in humanities, they live primarily outside the university sector. Now we've been talking about and gnawing away at this problem for years now with some small gains, but not the kind of traction I think we'd all like to achieve. But whenever I feel weary of the fight, and believe me, I do, I remind myself of something that a former Director General, Jan Fullerton, told me, that nothing really important ever happens in less than 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> this is so true of our work here at the library. Um, yeah, so you know, from, from when we started collecting, uh, collecting the webs to now, 23 years to Australian Web Archive, 23 years of effort to get our legislation changed to allow us to collect born digital. We work in 20 year time frames. But I'm an optimist and I think maybe, I hope it'll be less than 20 years in the case of the enriched and robust intersections that I think we need between our big collections and your data intensive research needs. Now, if this does start to emerge, it will be because we have sufficient common ground, sufficient intersections of interest to commit to one or more courses of action, and for you as a research community to commit investment to making that happen. 
Those courses of action might be large scale, but they might also be the smaller, more pragmatic approaches that deliver incremental improvements through funded work packages. The Trove team's work with Hass Devil on the Trove API is a recent example, and I'm glad that Seb mentioned um, APIs. They don't look after themselves. They need constant investment to remain relevant, and there isn't a constant funding stream to, to make that available to you, let alone to anybody else. They might be in the big infrastructure space. I feel like a cracked record when I say that we have huge digital collections here at the library and really only very thin pipes through which those collections can flow back and forth between us and you. Thicker pipes and the tools to make them work will only be possible if you decide it's worth investing in. It's not something we'll invest in because while we would love to be part of your solution, you are only part of the community that we serve. Now, the intersections might also be in the workforce capability space. After all, many of your students, I'm happy to say, end up working with us. Our workforce has transformed to meet our new digital needs and has been doing so for decades. This is not accidental. Any interaction I have with directors of other national libraries makes clear that many are struggling to shift their workforce into working and thinking digital by default. I'm happy to say this is not a problem we have here and that's something that I think we can use to our mutual benefit. In any of these cases, values and principles must underlie our intersections. I'm very struck by Daria's draft Heritage Data Reuse Charter, which says, the basis of the charter is a moral contract. The mission statement all stakeholders must adhere to. It comprises of six core principles, reciprocity, interoperability, citability, openness, stewardship, trustworthiness. So to conclude, and perhaps to take you back to a place of rest, for me as a custodian of a huge national heritage asset, the first of these is the most important. We want you to be able to use our big collections. We want you to lose yourself in billions of files. We want you to exercise your curiosity and to thicken up our understanding of the world in which we live. But we do not want you just to take our digital content away to your own labs, to do whatever you want to do with it and not return your findings in the form of some kind of open public value and especially in the public space in which so many Australians engage, that is, Trove. We love to work with you when your projects from the outset think about how to use our data to learn new things about it, to apply those learnings back to the data set and embed that knowledge for all to use. Kath Bode's recent project on literary works published in Australian newspapers is a wonderful example of this, as is the prosecution project running from Griffith University. These projects really are reciprocal. They began by considering interoperability in more than one direction. They were citable. They're open in very large public services. They were respectful of our role as stewards. They were respectful of our deep expertise and we built deep trust. So I hope that in thinking through the next phase of platforms for humanities and social sciences, that we can look at what works. We have enough examples of what works. What exists? What might connect us better? what partnership really means, and what investment makes sense in a scarce investment environment. I'd love us to avoid reinventing wheels that are successfully turning right around the country and the world. As Joy said at the beginning of the day, we here at the library provide source material, data and expertise. The infrastructure we have built, which draws together the collections of hundreds of institutions, not just ours, has indeed transformed Australian humanities research, and it does allow Australians to access it and use it for a range of benefits. So I think I will take issue with Ian's comment this morning that he says it's hard to get your hands around what a humanities capability might look like. I think we have part of the solution already sitting here in plain sight, and we have good early working examples of how to make it work better. I think what's hard to get our hands around 
is the ways in which power structures and funding structures and investment structures prevent us taking a holistic view that will maximise the national impact of Australian collections for all Australians. As Jennifer said earlier, knowledge and curiosity don't stop at the borders of your discipline, your language or your country. They don't stop at the board of institu borders of institutions or of sectors or of jurisdictions. I remain optimistic that we can chip away at those borders, but your voices, frankly, will be much louder than ours in that conversation. I hope also that we will increasingly think about humanities research that just happens to use data-intensive processes as another research methodology, not as something separate in a digital humanities or a libraries lab with people wearing lab coats. I'd like it to be open to all, something wild everywhere. And if that's the starting point of the research community, then I think we have a true point of intersection. Thank you. Right, I'm sure there must be questions now. But while you're, while you're warming up your ideas, I'll start with one. And I'd actually like to ask both of you, because one of the things I noticed kind of echoing in both of your, your talks in very different ways is the sense of an ever, ever richer environment. So the idea of there being more connectivity between objects, between research, between, between different um, levels of knowledge and places where knowledge comes from, but also between different kinds of people. And each one of those is going to bring different requirements and that hybridity and that, that change. And yet at the same time, this sort of sense of being perceived as, as one kind of institution or one kind of thing. Do you, do you feel that tension between the richness and the, the need to be kind of clear or to be distinct or defined? Um, are we on? Um, not sure. Okay, let me know if you can hear me. I've got a loud yeah. voice anyway. Good. Okay, thank you. Up the back there. Um, I I think that hmm, it depends what in in what spheres you're speaking. Mm. Um, if I'm talking to you as researchers, you understand thick and rich right. and kind of long term and serendipity and. Um, all of those things that I think as humanists we really, really love, yeah. um, they don't cut any ice whatsoever if I'm sitting in front of Senate estimates on the 9th of April. Um, so I think it, it does depend, um, I suppose, in the environments in which you're, you're speaking. Um, I would say um, there are issues in terms of how our institutions are perceived. Seb talked about museums being increasingly tourist attractions, yeah. and that's actually yeah. the, the case. And there are issues um, when you're perceived as arts, mm -hmm. which is almost seen as antithetical to infrastructure or to kind of digital excellence. Mm -hmm. um, I know that when I'm talking in government, you know, people are constantly shocked when I say, oh, yeah, yeah well, we're the first National Library in the world to do this. They, they just don't put the two things together. Yeah. So I think, I think it's a matter of the discourse that we use has to change according to mm. um, the environment in which we're mm. speaking. But at a deep level, I don't see any disjunction between those things at all. Mm. For me, they're part of the same thing. I just have to use different language in different environments. Mm. I love being able to speak in my metaphor language here. I couldn't do it in most places. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, it's, it's that um, we, we, we're good at speaking to people who have a similar perception of our in, 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 institutions and the purpose of our collections and our purpose of our exhibits, in my, in my case, when they share them. Mm -hmm. um, and our, for my museum, we, 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 we've, the brand is not what it needs to be. It isn't clear, which is why we're doing a rebrand and a huge project around that and refreshing the building in other places that I've worked. Again, it's been the need to 
even within the institution, have the people, have the team inside the museum who is in charge of the brand and the marketing mm -hmm. and getting a grasp of the complexity, the nuance and the diversity of the things you actually do. Um, that's actually almost as hard as speaking to uh, um, economists and uh, politicians, I would mm -hmm. say. That inside the museum, if there isn't a sense, or in, in, um, inside the li library, whoever's making, whoever's making decisions around brand and the manifestations mm -hmm. of that brand and identity, um, that's the bit that seems like the lowest hanging fruit, but it's mm. the hardest to get mm. to. Mm. Um, and I think that's also because we, we get stuck in the complexity because we like that. Mm. But I think yeah. oft, often other, other people are like, can you just be one thing? Yes. Um, yeah. you, you know, I think the Cooper Hewitt work for the Smithsonian, you know, everybody was like, oh, it's the pen, it's this thing, because it was an object, it was yeah. an obvious marker of difference, yeah. um, which was great, but that, Obs that, that obscured a lot of the other stuff that, mm. that uh, arguably was, was, well, was more impactful and more important and made that possible. Mm. Um, so that repositioning piece is something that the, in, the internal challenges around that, uh, I think start with our own staff and then go up to the board. Mm -hmm. um, and then once it goes to the board, and the board can get, in, get into a lift with a politician or a, lob um, um, a lobbyist and say, this is what we, we do and it's all these things and. And Australia and New Zealand have done some of the best digital humanity stuff for, for 30 years or more and, and are not rec rec recognised for it mm. enough. Um, and I, I think culturally too, I mean as a New Zealander, we don't, we're not very good at talking about things that are actually groundbreaking and great mm. properly. Mm. We're a bit shy about that. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually, I think that might be a feature of institutions in, right. in Australia. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of natural reticence um, that it's hard to break out of. Um, but it does mean that... Um, I, I think that, you know, going back to how people think of us, I think it's so much easier for a whole lot of people out there who, who make those kind of decisions about an investment to think of us as the one thing full of dusty shelves. It's really easy. Oh, I'm so sick of it. You know, um, yeah. but whereas, you know, that's our, our message is complex. Mm -hmm. And particularly when you're trying to say, we are print and digital, we're mm. hybrid, we're mm. that interface between those things, mm. um, that's hard to get across. Mm. And, and do you think there's more, you know, as researchers who are sort of dependent on and working with cultural heritage institutions and, and working in the digital, I mean, Seb, you mentioned the whole idea of, of you know, not platforms, not projects. It's something that I think we're very bad about if we build projects and then we're like, okay, I'm on to the next thing. I, you, you clean it up. Um, but also, I, you know, and, and, and really, as you, you mentioned, you know, if we create knowledge, we should give it back. Is there more that we as researchers should be doing to make both the both the simplicity and the complexity of of institutions like yours work better for for society as a whole. Um, I mean, I think for for us, it's, it's certainly some of the most successful ARC pro projects that I've been, mm. been 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 involved in, particularly during the powerhouse years, were actually ones that had public out out yeah. out, 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 out out outcomes mm -hmm. that the researchers saw the value of the museum as a yeah. site for. Um, I say publishing, but I'm going to pub publishing their research mm -hmm. as an experience, mm -hmm. and and that was super val valuable. There, there was a project that came out of an ARC, ARC with Fiona Cameron um, that resulted in a project called Design Hub or D Hub, uh, which was which became a design magazine, which mm -hmm. stayed on uh, line for ne nearly a decade. Mm -hmm. The first three th three 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 years of that, the editorial of that was driven out of the ARC which generated all this parallel mm. research around the use of museum collections as data. But the public interface for that, for, for, for that wasn't necessarily about the data piece at all. It was that it supported this design magazine to exist on mm. the web. Mm. The marketing team at the Powerhouse and the curators at the Powerhouse saw value, value in that because a publishing plat platform had been made almost as a a byproduct of the research piece. Mm. Um, other times we've seen great exhibitions come out of that, mm. that work too. Mm. And it's that ability to sort of see the mutual interests and where they need, the outcomes need 
for our institutions need to return public value mm -hmm. and it needs to be visibly seen to do that. Yeah. Uh, and we know that the research needs to happen to deliver perhaps adjacent out, out, outcomes and they need to be sort of mentally corralled into a way that they can be considered in the same way. Mm. I think I'd pick up on that. We're talking about ARC grants now, so we may as well continue. Uh, we've been involved in, uh, we've been partners in uh, more than 40 over the last 10 years. And um, I guess our emphasis in partnering in ARC grants has changed because um, we need to kind of make sure that our needs are being met and the public value is being delivered. So in fact, the ones that are working best for us at the moment are the ones that develop new collections. Mm -hmm. So we do okay. a lot of oral history projects now where um, the researchers have a particular thing they're interested in. We have the stable of interviewers, we have the technology, we can hang on to that oral history mm -hmm. for the long term. And we've worked um, uh, with partners around the infrastructure that meets their needs and that kind of gets people straight to the object. So increasingly, mm -hmm. in fact, I think there are going to be very few situations in which we'd participate in ARC grants mm -hmm. in the future that yeah. didn't build our collections in, in some way. Um, but I think just thinking about ARC and thinking about what Australian researchers can do, you know, you're the only ones who can kind of really think about what, you know, I know that that pot is smaller than it was and you will be lobbying for that, but thinking carefully about um, what you know, what the construction of funding mechanisms is or should be, because certainly from a public institution perspective, the funding structures are not very useful for us mm. um, and probably haven't delivered the kind of large-scale value we might have liked. Mm. And, you know, I just remind everybody that, you know, it was in 2007 when the ARC application that was... You know, every Australian university, the National Library and every state and territory library all partnered on to start digitising newspapers was rejected. <laughs> rejected. And we started on our own and we've gotten a long way. I actually sometimes think maybe that's a good thing because we might have gone down a paradigm that was thinking primarily from an academic researcher perspective mm -hmm. instead of a public content. Mm -hmm. But I guess we, I, I think that this is where the academic community can say whether it's <coughs> ARC or whether it's where the research investment needs to go around platforms. <coughs> mm. I think you're the ones who have the power there. Mm. We certainly don't, you know, it's, mm. and it's the education mm. department yeah. that can drive this. Yeah. My minister, just not on the agenda. So, you know, if you want to have better infrastructure involving our big collections, then really the advocacy board is in your court. Interesting. I think we have a question up in the back there. Hi. Thank you, um, yes. Sorry. Um, oh. oh, right up the back. Uh, so I'll go quickly. It's a quick one. It touches on your point, Mara Louise, about the political structures that are there or not there. So, um, and this actually perhaps also includes you, Jennifer. I'm looking at LIBA, uh, the mm. European Association of Research Libraries, who have both university and national libraries in their membership. They have memorandum of understanding with DARIA, mm -hmm. the Consortium of European Research Libraries, SPARC, UDAT, IFLA, um, and many others, including Claren. So, uh, in the European context, um, there are memorandum of understanding between multiple parties. Uh, what sort of formal mechanisms do we have in place or need to be put in place, in your view? Um, well, I can certainly talk from the library perspective and to say that things are moving this space. Um, of course, as a national library, we're a member of IFLA, for those who are not library people, International Federation of Library Associations, and does a lot of really good foundational work that ultimately you benefit from. Um, uh, also, of course, we participate with other national libraries. Um, in relation to CALL, um, CALL is, has been a long time partner in our older metadata sharing service, Libraries Australia. And we are now shifting that into a broader 
um, digital and business and governance model that encompasses the entirety of our metadata and digital content world. But I actually would want to say that this is actually with our, <laughs> this is going to sound very crass, our strategic relationship is with you, the researchers. Our only financial relationship is with the university libraries. Mm. And they have made clear that they cannot and will not pay one dollar more to support this national infrastructure. <laughs> so from my perspective, our issue isn't around call. It's actually, it's further up in universities because it's a researcher community. 30% of the use of Trove is by Australian academics. Mm. But our relationship isn't there. And frankly, our degree of common interests with university libraries is less and less because we're about long-term um, collections. And universities, of course, increasingly are not. Mm. For the big university libraries, 90% of their budgets is spent on licensed resources because their needs, they're meeting the immediate needs of students and academics. That's not the business we're in. Mm. So I actually think where our relationship is at the wrong place, mm -hmm. and that is something that will take some time to address. We certainly want to continue working with university libraries, but in terms of this big content we're talking about, that's not where the strategic issues lie. Should we go to the second question there? Hello, thank you. Um, Melanie Swallow from Swinburne University. Um, Marie Louise, I really loved your uh, um, speaking about the curiosity uh, of um, bringing researchers in and them, them exploring and digging into the, the loam. I'm wanting to push that a little bit uh, to look forward to the moment when researchers are doing that and trying to you know, continue to create new knowledge, bringing their imaginations to the collections, but when there risk being significant gaps in the digital loam, as you refer to it. So my work is in software preservation yep. and uh, we've been talking over lunch uh, with Jane um, Simpson about how my team's work in that area could contribute to potentially a national software library or something like that. And uh, she was uh, recognising that there could be huge benefit for her area, for instance, uh, with being able to open files in legacy packages on computers, you know, obsolete um, dependencies, basically operating systems and all the rest. So, uh, so you were calling for us to lobby for the library because our voices would be louder and I, I get that point. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, kind of echoing and picking up on Carolyn Shrive's um, invitation earlier to, to think big and imagine, um, you know, where should this kind of infrastructure sit? Um, and that's really a question to both of you. Uh, should it be a new thing or should it be attached to an existing thing? Uh, where should these things live that we're anticipating um, need to be there in our repertoire, in that digital loam? Um, I, I just, there's a couple of things I want to say. Um, I'm not necessarily asking you to advocate for the library, although I'd be thrilled if you did. <laughs> I'm asking you to advocate for the fact that big collections live in cultural institutions that are not inside universities and we need to connect them all. Mm. So that's one thing I just want to make clear. But if you want to lobby for the library, you just go right ahead, <laughs> OK? Um, you know, there's an election coming. <laughs> um, I think in terms of... You also just mentioned kind of... Uh, and, and I think one of the things there is to think about lobbying for collections. Mm. You've mentioned... You've talked about digital gaps. We're really aware of these. So we know the bits that we're kind of managing okay. We're doing really well now at collecting born digital books, journals, pictures, manuscripts, maps, huge maps collections. You know, we just gulp in 10,000 digital maps, just like that now, hmm. doing really well at that. We've done pretty well with the web, but we have a pressing need to rebuild our collecting infrastructure, but we won't do it alone. We, we will probably be doing it with our partners in NASLA. But whenever we have these conversations, we say, yeah, but what about social media? Because it's hard and there have been huge failures. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of archives, partial archives in Australia, but they're not connected up to anything. 
Um, I worry greatly about games. Um, ACME, of course, has games. Nobody has legal deposit responsibility for games. And unless you've got legislation to back you up, you can't make it happen. Hmm. The National Film and Sound Archive has no legal deposit legislation to enforce the deposit of Australian audiovisual works. Hmm. And there is nothing about software hmm. as kind of works. So, you know, you could see them as, as works that should just fall under legal deposit, but then you say, well, where should it happen? So I, I would love to see a conversation. I would love to see an environment in which there was sufficient appetite in, I guess, the education and the cultural spheres to have the conversation to say, what are we collecting reasonably well? Is that good enough at the moment? Should we just kind of pause our investment on that? What are we not doing at all? Where is the best place to happen? Mm -hmm. So I think thinking about those digital gaps, believe me, it keeps me awake at night, really mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. In terms of where infrastructure lives, I think the issue is that it shouldn't matter where it lives and it's ridiculous to have funding structures that are based on where it lives. Mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. now in the cloud environment. Mm -hmm. And when I say lives, I don't just mean physically. Um, although at this point in time, Trove, our digital collection, six petabytes of it, literally lives three floors up on the second floor of this building. Uh, and and the, the case, well, there is no financial case for shifting to cloud at the moment, and we have no means of investing in the lift and shift kind of problem. So I think for the foreseeable future, we're still going to see infrastructure collections um, you know, in institutions, and I don't see the cloud as a solution to all. Then I think you need to think what kinds of infrastructure. The infrastructure I'm talking about here is the collections. They are the infrastructure. The infrastructure you might be thinking about might be the tools that you need to analyse it. And the place where we need to connect them is, you know, yeah, but how do we get it back into public value? Mm -hmm. does, does, that, does that help? Or does it just make it worse? <laughs> yeah. No, no, it was just a, a speculative, open-ended, an opportunity to speculate, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I think Australia is doing, and this is what you don't realise, we're doing quite well compared mm -hmm. to most jurisdictions. We mm -hmm. should be ambitious to do more. And I've recently been characterising our situation here at the library in that our ambitions for the impact and value we could deliver from our collections, and I know that Seb feels this way as well, don't match the resource that governments of either persuasion are willing to invest to make it so. So we have to keep the ambition alive, yeah. even in dark times. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think on the software preservation issue, there, there's an opportunity to, to actually think of an infrastructure that is mm. cloud first, potentially, yeah, and is distributed by design. Mm. Um, and I think that, that the ARC pro projects that you're running and, and several other projects are, are, are potentially starting to begin that, or continue in some, some, some cases, the, the discussion of having a distributed national collection and I think within the glam space too, the difference between collecting as a library, collecting as an archive, collecting and exhibiting and interpreting as a museum, and, and that other piece, the G bit, which is all the soft software art, which is pretty much all contemporary art nowadays. Um, you know, so um, that, that is a huge opportunity for us collectively, uh, which we, we could show a lot of leadership in, but it does feel like we need to, we need to figure out a way to be less um, uh, regional about it. Uh, and that's, that in Australia, it still seems like... The, and, and, and that is encouraged at the state level, again, by the tourist challenge, that, mm. that particularly in the museum and gallery space, we, the... the, the the inbound tourist dollar drives the comp comp competition between the museums and the galleries in Queen Queensland, the museums and galleries in New South Wales, the museums and galleries in Vic Vic Victoria, and then there are the other states. But the most of the tourists, I would argue, are probably coming to those three states, mm -hmm. and actually three cities. And, and so mm -hmm. that cultural tourist dollar 
is not aligned with where um, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 frustrating, and we need to find a way. And we need to find a way to break out of that, and and part of that is using the institutions, particularly the galleries and the and uh, the museums, as exhibiting places to show what is actually possible, to show public value from ingesting things in the first place, because because that's the bit that. Museums should be really good at that. They really should be. We're not always good at that, but we should be. I think um, that idea of exhibiting what's possible, what's ingested, oh, the terms we use in the digital world are just <laughs> ghastly, aren't they? <laughs> is important. We've been talking in the library recently here about, um, you know, as we think about, well, you know, because we have a, a kind of a difficult funding future ahead of us and we've been thinking about the factors in our context and, and um, I remember one of us said uh, at a meeting, I can't remember which of my colleagues it was who said, you know, our problem is that the collections that politicians value, the ones that they love to see that they understand are the ones we collected 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think that is yeah. the case. And um, so it's, it is, you know, trying to kind of... Um, bring the general public along in such a way that they become your fiercest advocates is important. And sometimes you're doing that without even realising that it's happening. Mm -hmm. um, mm. So that when the thing that you treasure in the digital space might seem to be threatened and all of a sudden there's an avalanche <laughs> of public protest about its potential loss, you actually realise they're on your side. So. Yeah, I mean, this, this was a big driver between the putting the media, the media preservation lab in, mm. in our build building as a public facing space. We could have made another gallery out of that space, but the decision was to bring that activity right up to the front so that digital preservation was something that had a physical site you could look in and see things at. Now, I have no idea what people are going to look in and see. Yeah. Um, it might be very, it's going to look, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how that turns out anyway. Um, but that, that was very particularly about trying to show this stuff might yeah. matter yeah. and that might mean your children's videos on your phone that you have no way of moving to another serv serv service. That might be the hook in to a whole lot of other mm. stuff or it might actually be the memories of you growing up as a kid playing certain video games mm. or perhaps one of those politicians who still live in the 1950s thinking about the, their mm. grandkids playing particular video games when they were growing up, I, I don't know. <laughs> but I mean, I think both of you are, are kind of, to me, sort of orbiting around one of the great challenges of infrastructure, because one of the best, the really good infrastructure will disappear. You know, I don't think anyone in this room woke up this morning and said, thank God there's electricity. Yeah. Or, you know, and, and you're, not, you're, not, you're not thrilled that there's roads until the point in time when there's too much traffic yeah. and you're actually the opposite of thrilled. Yeah. And, and I wonder, you know, some of what I'm hearing, I mean, the whole idea of having a visible lab for digital preservation, I mean, I, it seems like you're actually trying to make that thing that needs to come to the back come to the fore. And, you know, the whole idea for simple messaging, you know, maybe some of what we need to do is find ways of expressing infrastructure better than as the thing that, you know, like having lots of copies of books or legal deposit, all of these social and, and technological mechanisms that make things available. Mm -hmm. Maybe we just, you know, maybe we need a, a kind of a public awareness campaign of all the great infrastructure you have around you. But of course, that's not what infrastructure is about. Well, I, I, as I said, I think our experience has been that it's not until it appears to be threatened mm -hmm. that okay. um, the support comes out of the woodwork. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was okay. just thinking about digital preservation. Uh, we have digital preservation running right here in this library. And as far as I'm aware, no universities have um, di you know, digital, true digital preservation systems in production. We yeah. do. Yeah. So actually what you just see would be a screen with hundreds, thousands of files flashing through at the speed of light yep. getting into yep. <laughs> Preservica. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that um, Tim Sherrod in the audience here has long had a dream, and I share that dream, that, um, uh, that some enlightened festival, Canberrans know about enlightened, you know, where we put things on our buildings, that we will be able to convince the designers that they should be showing trove at work or digital mm -hmm. preservation mm -hmm. work 
on our building to show that it's happening all the time, and that's mm. an argument we haven't won. We don't we don't get to commission the works; they just do them. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I mean, they're not our branding people. I Sorry, yeah. this is this is ACT tourism, and therefore actually they're thinking about books and manuscripts. So, yeah. so it's interesting. I, I just went to a talk by Rafik Anadol, who's a young uh, contemporary artist, Turkish based based in LA now, who just did some work with the D Disney Theatre in LA, uh, where he worked. He and his studio worked with. Um, uh, the archives of the building and all the performances in it and did this huge uh, machine kind of learning based uh, projection mapped uh, projections of the arc the arc the, the archive on the building itself including the generation of new works through mm. that and it was mm. an amazing mm. if bombastic piece it's up on <laughs> Vimeo uh, but Refik Anadol like there are artists mm. working in this space who who, who want access to this stuff, but they're going to the th places that are more obviously going to be bombastic. Mm. So I can imagine the Opera House will get that projection mapped mm. archive before the NLA does. And actually, the, a the API for Trove would be much more usable by a series of, 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 the, um, of artists than what the Opera House has. And may maybe that's a challenge between the, the, the ACT Tourism Board and New South Wales Tourism yeah, Board. Yeah, so tourism, I don't really care about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it could make the archive visible. Oh, uh, the yeah. Refik Anadol piece is amazing. I'll tweet it out yeah, later. It's, it's All right. So, so this will be the new, the new slogan, you know, come to Canberra, our infrastructure is great. And you can see it, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, speaking of infrastructure, I don't see any other questions from the audience, but we are also at the time of tea, and I do consider hot beverages to be a key form of infrastructure for the rest of the day. So I think we'll have our tea break now. I'm just looking for somebody to confirm this with a nod to me. Yes? Good. And then we'll be back, I think, in half an hour. Good. Thank you very much. <laughs>